So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the uh, the second part of the uh, this <coughs> webinar on Uvitis. Welcome to the Swissix Eye Group. It's nice to have you uh, with us. So as uh, with previous webinars, this webinar is being recorded and will be available to watch again on the YouTube channel, East Sussex Eye Group. There is CET points available for optomet optometrists and dispensing opticians, and I'll upload the CET this weekend. So the lecture will run for approximately 45 minutes with about 15 minutes at the end for questions. So if you do have any questions, please click in the Q&A box at the bottom, type your questions in, and we'll try and get through as many questions as we can at the end. So I'd like to welcome our guest speaker tonight, Shamran Kashani. He's an ophthalmic consultant surgeon at East Sussex Healthcare, Healthcare Trust, specialising in complex cataract surgery, premium lens implants, and management of complex medical retina and uveitis disorders. He's the head of retinal services and uveitis, and is the lead for Southeast Eye Surgeons. He has also completed two advanced fellowships in medical retina and uveitis. So tonight he will present to us a webinar on the approach to understanding and managing inflammatory eye disease and interesting cases. So thank you very much, Mr. Kshani, and I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you, Ian, for that lovely introduction. Um, right, you should have my screen now. So, um, okay. Um, so I've got 10 cases today uh, that I want to uh, go through with you. And essentially, um, these are all 10 different conditions um, it's very difficult to just learn uveitis in two um, lectures, but I just hope that I can kind of give you some sort of algorithm uh, about how to manage patients, when to panic, and what different things you need to be thinking about. So, next slide. Okay, so when you see a patient with uveitis, just think, is this just anterior uveitis? Is it posterior uveitis? Is it pan uveitis, i.e. front and back? Or is it intermediate, which is essentially kind of in the more in the middle part of the of the eye? Um, so that's um, vitritis and pars planitis. So you need to think anatomically where the condition is, and that's important because actually conditions that tend to affect more than just the front, i.e., vasculitis, vitritis, retinitis, choroiditis, tend to be associated with systemic conditions or infections. Um, the second thing is, can you see a pattern? So very important in uveitis patients to find that full medical history, because often that can be a clue. I, the eye it may not be the first symptom. So you might have somebody with sarcoid or Bechet's who will come to you with uveitis and say, oh yes, I've got sarcoid or Bechet's, and that can help quite a lot. Or if they've been somewhere abroad and ask about the sexual history and stuff like that. So pattern recognition is very important in uveitis. I suppose the third thing that you need to think about is do I have time for investigations? And this is something we often think about when patients come into us and we have to think that we either have to start treatment or we have, to, um, we have time to wait for the investigations to come back so we can target the treatment more appropriately. And the next thing is that you need to probably think, is this something that just affects the eye or is this uh, something that um, is systemic? So for example, there are certain conditions like bird shot, purely ocular, no systemic side effects, and something like thyroid, which has systemic side effects. And that's an issue for patients. It's very important for them to know. And also you've got to think, uh, or they have to think really, do they need lifelong immunosuppression? Um, and and for, for some people that can be uh, life-changing. You know, we're talking about high doses of steroids, biologics, all things that can actually affect other organs in the body. So uveitis can affect your life in a very significant way. And I suppose, um, you know, the main three um, characters, I, in fact, one thing that I haven't written here, which is probably just as important as the three here is idiopathic, i.e. you never find a cause. But actually the main three that one thinks about when patients come through the door, is this infectious? Is it non-infectious? Or is it masquerading something? often uh, neoplastic like lymphoma or um, leukemia affecting the back of the eye. But within the infectious, you go through your kind of uh, various conditions, bacterial, viral, fungal, uh, parasitic. So we tend to see, um, you know, a lot of TB or syphilis, um, herpes, uh, the group with the viral and toxo with the uh, parasitic group. 
with the non-infectious group, um, as I mentioned, there is an association with systemic side effects. So um, sarcoid, Bechet's, um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease and the HLA-B27 group are associated with that. And I've already mentioned your classic. So just think about these three kind of broad things when you see a patient with uveitis as that will target your treatment and your investigation. So the first case, a 47-year-old Caucasian male, these are all real cases. I haven't made them up, but they're from various hospitals. Um, blurred vision in both eyes, flashing lights and floaters for about a month. He is colorblind, or he has been colorblind since birth, and he has bilateral congenital ptosis. He mentioned that six months ago, he traveled to Jamaica. And um, apart from being vegan, he voluntarily mentioned that a year ago, he's um, sexual transmitted disease screen was negative. So you've got blurred vision in both eyes, okay? So vision is 618, 612. And uh, there's some, you can see on the cornea, some pigmented uh, KPs with normal pressures. Um, and here we have a right fundus picture. So this is one of the difficulties with this kind of setting is that I don't have access to you guys to grill you but you can hopefully agree with me that the picture looks not so clear. Um, and that's very important in uveitis because if the picture is not very clear, it indicates there's inflammation in the anterior posterior chamber. And hopefully you will realize that the disc looks quite hyperemic and swollen. And exactly the same thing with the other eye. So again, you've got vitritis um, and a swollen disc. So this is fluorescein angiography. Uh, let me just see if I can move that up there. I'm not sure if you're kind of seeing that. So fluorescein angiography just shows that you have this hot disc and hot disc in fluorescein angiography is sign of leakage of the blood vessels from inflammation at, at, at the disc. Fluorescein angiography can be, no, can be quite useful because actually you can see in this setting, for example, along this vein, you can see that there is some staining of the blood vessels. Whereas when you look at the pictures, uh, that I showed you, you couldn't see an obvious uh, vasculitic lesion al along that. And this kind of staining is something that's accentuated when you do fluorescein angiography, something that's subclinical, but tells you that something's going on in the back of the eye. This is ICG, not showing anything too exciting. So you've got blurred disc margins, you've got hyperemic looking discs, you've got vitritis, um, here is kind of some general information about his blood pressure and BM. At this point, I'll be asking you what you think various differential diagnosis is. So again, think about, is it infectious? Is it non-infectious? Non Could it be masquerade? Um, and kind of, you're just going through the big four. So with him, uh, and you've seen this slide before, just going through these investigations. Just remember, if one thing you're going to remember, just remember this slide about the big three in uh, uveitis. So we didn't have time to wait per se. I mean, you know, vision was down to 612, 618. So we gave him some DEXA drops to help with the anterior uveitis and uh, vitritis, uveitis and vitritis, some cyclone maxitrol. Next day's vision was profoundly down 660, but pinholing to 69. So because there wasn't much time, we started him on one milligram per kilogram of prednisolone. And he comes back a week later with counting fingers vision in both eyes. And he says that he's lost quite a lot of weight in the last six months. So this is when panic buttons are ringing because actually uh, you think you've made him worse with the steroids. And of course, at the time that he was seen, he, some investigations were sent um, and essentially nothing major. The CRP is a little bit raised. His inflammatory markers are fine. Serum ACE, which is something for you look for sarcoid, was normal. Uh, rheumatoid factor positive, so that may or may not be significant. But his syphilis test came back positive. So he had syphilis affecting his eyes. Um, and he was sent to the Royal London. He was somebody that we saw at Moorfields, and he was started on intravenous um, uh, penicillin for neurosyphilis. And two weeks later, his visual acuity had improved significantly. So 612 in both eyes and 69. Um, he was on oral prednisolone tapering. Some, a lot of times with uveitis patients, even if it's even if it is infectious, 
um, you, the steroids can help to uh, manage the inflammation side of things while you've got antibiotic cover. And this is something that you will hear as we go on. But obviously with this condition, we got him off the systemic steroids quite quickly because he had neurosyphilis. He was also diagnosed with HIV. His CD4 count was 238 and he was started on triple therapy together with the penicillin. So neurosyphilis uh, is something that, um, by the way, syphilis can pretty much do anything. So if you ever suck for an answer, if you say syphilis, you'll probably be, uh, probably be right. But anyway, with neurosyphilis, you, these are the kind of things you tend to get, personality change, ataxia, stroke, blurred vision, actually interesting, only 17%, headaches, deafness, and seizures. So the effects can be quite profound. And these are kind of what you would see in clinical examination, um, uh, et cetera. So uh, this is what you'd see in a neurological exam. So various treatment regime, if somebody is HIV negative or HIV positive, if they are HIV positive, then obviously they're massively immunosuppressed and the syphilis will be affecting them um, in a much worse way. So that's kind of something to take into account. And really the learning point from this case was that you have to act quickly when the vision's down. Uh, you may get it wrong occasionally. So with this case, we had to start the patient with um, uh, oral kind of prednisolone because we wanted to treat the inflammation, but obviously you must, must follow these patients up very closely. So perhaps a week was a bit too long, uh, but really the, you know, when you're starting them on high dose oral prednisolone, you're not sure for sure that this is not infective, then you do need to closely follow them up. Um, and of course, when you see a patient with syphilis, always think about HIV. A lot of patients with uh, undiagnosed syphilis happen to have concurrent HIV infection as well. Okay, on to case two. So the 29 year old uh, female um, with a flow tip for about three days, nothing exciting in the history apart from panic attacks and depression. She came with vision of 6.6 on the right and 6.12 on the left. So um, here uh, you can see hopefully if you agree, sexual branch of vein occlusion. She doesn't have any involvement of the macula, which is why the vision is good. But this looks more different than just the vein occlusion. So if you look, you can see that the blood vessel is, um, you've got this kind of vasculitic change on the vein. So th there's vasculitis as well as a vein occlusion. And if you um, kind of think about what can make a vein clot, you can have it if something is compressing on the vein, like you have in hypertension where the artery is pressing down on the vein and you can get a vein occlusion. You can have it if the blood, um, if the blood itself is too sticky, like in conditions such as polycythemia rubavera, when you've got very thickened uh, blood and dehydration and stuff like that, or you can get a vein occlusion when the blood vessels are sticky and that happens in vasculitis. So we were worried that this patient had some sort of vasculitis and this is kind of looking at it further up, you can just see that vessel is definitely affected by vasculitis as is this vessel here. And that's why there's a vein occlusion. The other eye looks completely normal. And this is just some fluorescent angiography that we see. And that just shows um, the kind of effect of vasculitis. There's a lot of bits missing here. That's the hemorrhage just masking the angiography. So no questions for you guys, but of course, just with any other um, condition, again, think infection, have you been abroad, any sexual con recent sexual history of that may highlight something, um, any systemic conditions, but you always ask through the systemic history about any rashes, any joint problems, any breathing problems, any ulcers. And this lady had both oral genital ulcerations at King's um, the oral ulcerations had been around when she was just under 20, but genital ulcers at age of four, and the biopsy was negative. So hopefully with the history of this kind of ulceration, your head is kind of thinking towards inflammatory cause. There wasn't anything really to suggest that there was an infective cause. And we started the patient on Maxidex and oral prednisolone. So two weeks later, the results came back, syphilis was negative, uh, generally serum ACE, which is sarcoid, was also normal. 
the CRP and ESR were just slightly raised. Um, nothing really to go on about. Vision was okay. Uh, we started to reduce the prednisolone by five milligrams per week. That's often what you do when patients are started on high dose prednisolone. You start off with you know one milligram per kilogram and then reduce it by um, you know ten milligrams uh, per week, and then at some point you go to five, and then when you get to 25 or 20, you sl slow it down a bit more. So eventually we stopped the prednisolone and then she was stable for three months and then she had a non-vision threatening BRVO in the other eye, which means the macula wasn't involved. And she started to get mouth lesions as well. So now you're thinking more along the lines of uh, some sort of systemic inflammatory conditions such as Bechet's. And she was started on azathioprine, which is an immunosuppressant, as well as the steroids. Because she was at the age, she was uh, the, the age to get pregnant, she wanted to get pregnant. So we had to think about that. It was quite a delicate uh, talk really, because with a lot of these second line immunosuppressants, um, they're teratogenic. So you have to be very careful in counseling patients. So we got her back on the prednisolone again um, and weaned her off azathioprine. She got pregnant, had a healthy baby boy, and then she went back on azathioprine again. So, um, with one of the things that's quite important about this case is that she started off with a vein occlusion. It ended up being something more than a vein occlusion. There was a systemic cause for it. And we, she was diagnosed with Bechet's, but then the Bechet's then needs lifelong immunosuppression. She's very lucky to have had two vein occlusions, which did not affect the macula. And so she was, she was lucky to escape that. Now with this immunosuppression, she's now on that for, for life. So, um, you generally cannot have uh, uveitis patients on high dose of prednisolone because prednisolone or oral steroids are very good at getting you over the tough time that you're going through there and then, but then long-term you have to have them down. And generally the oral prednisolone needs to be less than seven or eight milligrams a day. So if you've got anything around 10 to 15, you need to think about second line agents. This is a nice, picture just showing chronologically what happened to her vein occlusion and you can see that it completely disappeared over time. So steroids are relatively safe, I don't want to say safe obviously, but relatively safe to use during pregnancy. It's actually been used um, in a lot of patients such as VKH, uh, Wegener's granulomatosis, uh, PIC um, and um, other, other conditions. So there are that you can use them, but of course you need to liaise with pediatricians and the obstetrics gynecologist when you're doing it. There's higher risk of intrauterine growth retardation, uh, especially during the first trimester with uh, oral prednisolone. So, in this particular case, obviously that was kind of the um, learning point, just collaborating with other teams. And I guess that's one of the advantages of working in a hospital when you've got pediatrics and obstetrics gynae around you, where some of these tertiary centres like. Morphers, you don't have that at hand, so it's always a little bit more difficult to manage them. And then, um, you know, with patients like this, if they're considering pregnancy, you have to think about the washout period. It would take weeks or months uh, before they can get uh, pregnant to allow um, the drug to have been washed out. And as I said, she had Bechet's disease. While I was there, she didn't come back. So hopefully that's controlled her. But uh, that was an example of somebody who. Um, needed lifelong immunosuppression. Interestingly, I think from a Bechet's point of view, just for the oral ulcerations, they wouldn't have started on, her on azathioprine and prednisolone, but because she'd had two significant ocular events, that was the trigger to start her on, on immunosuppression. Case three, a 42 year old female Caucasian, uh, progressive loss of vision in the left eye. She was diagnosed with systemic lupus Erythematous is a nasty condition affecting mainly kidneys and blood vessels can, can cause hypertension and, and all sorts. Um, and can affect your joints and skin rash, etc. So it's a systemic condition. So in this particular patient, we knew she had that. Previous kidney transplant, and she was on masses of drugs. So tacrolimus, which is a um, immunosuppressant, um, she was on prednisolone. Um, note that the dose is seven and a half to five milligrams alternating. So with a lot of these patients, as I said, you have second line agents to bring the oral prednisolone down. You can't have them on high dose 
long term. She's also on Celsept, another second line immunosuppressant and hydroxychloroquine. A lot of these drugs are obviously there for the kidney transplant that she'd had and lots of other things. So vision was 618 on the left, 66 on the right. Um, nothing else going on. That's the clinical picture of the left eye. Difficult to see. Generally, the blood vessels are very well defined. No obvious vasculitis. This looks okay. So it doesn't look as if there's vitritis, but you might get an idea that there's a bit of swelling centrally. Other eye looks fine. And that's the OCT of the left eye. So quite a large uh, subretinal fluid. So we thought she had CSR. Um, she was essentially hospital, hos hospitalized because there was deterioration of her renal function because of her lupus nephritis and they had to increase her prednisolone, which is obviously not great when you've got CSR and the cells that went off as well. Um, visual acuity kind of amazingly remained stable, but the CSR was then present in both eyes as a result of um, the issues with the steroids. So this is often a question we are asked. Um, obviously you want to do fluorescent angiography is quite a common uh, diagnostic test we do in clinic for patients with uveitis or macular disorders. So in renal impairment, uh, using fluorescent angiography is not contraindicated, even if they have renal failure, because we only use a small amount of fluorescein dye, it's completely fine to use a fluorescein angiography. Um, and of course, the other thing was that could the raised BP been a problem with the CSR as another thing. But in her history, uh, she had lots of different things. So um, she deteriorated vision in the right eye, but the left got the, was the same, so 618 in both eyes. This was kind of showing you more CSR uh, in both. And when you have fluorescein angiography, you could see multifocal spots lighting up. So this is often quite a classic picture with CSR, which we call smokestack. So that's kind of the bit of the RPE that's defective and the fluorescein is going into retinal space. Um, <clears throat> so she had CSR on the right, multifocal CSR on the left, and these are the general risk factors with uh, CSR, but in him, he had corticosteroids, tacrolimus, renal impairment, organ transplants, so semi-hypertension, all these would have contributed to CSR. So very, very difficult condition to treat when you can't just wean them off steroids and other immunosuppressants. Um, and actually, we looked online and found that actually SLE on its own can also cause CSR. So that would have been another cause for it. So multifactorial in the patient, and he never recovered, unfortunately, from that uh, CSR. Um, one thing you can do with chronic CSR, by the way, when it doesn't look as if they're likely to recover, is that you can try um, half fluence PDT in order to try and flatten the uh, retina. But as there are ongoing aggravating factors in this patient, uh, that wasn't of success, um, unfortunately, in this patient, and the vision declined. And you can actually lose your sight quite badly from uh, chronic CSR. In clinic, generally, 10% of patients who come with CSR tend to have chronic CSR. So that gives you some sort of um, idea of uh, what's going on. Um, next patient, 22-year-old Asian female, myopic uh, student nurse on a surgical ward. She, good vision in the left eye, right eye vision was down to 618. And we thought, well, she came in with the optician writing that the retina was lifting. Uh, and she had some fever, sore throat, she'd been unwell for a few weeks. So we thought, well, you know, could that be contributory? So you need to think, again, always think about what I said with your uveitis kind of patients, think systemic conditions, think infection, um, she had mouth ulcers, but no genital ulcers. So mouth ulcers on their own, very poor indica indication of Bechet's on their own. Well, we knew she'd had BCG and had BNC as she was a student nurse on the ward. Apart from that, she uh, was quite thin um, and blood pressure was okay. So that's the clinical picture. So you can see the disc. Again, when you're looking at a picture on the, um, you know, with uveitis, so the kind of things you're looking for is look for cells. So can you see AC cells? Can you see vitreous cells? The fact that she had such an amazing fundus photos tells you she had neither. Then look at the blood vessels. So look to see if there's any vasculitis. Look at the retina, look at the choroid. Are there any choroidal retinal lesions? And finally, uh, look at the disc to see if the disc is swollen. So here, the only thing you can hopefully see 
is this deep-seated lesion that's just next to the disc and it's kind of quite pale yellow. The blood vessels going underneath it, sorry, over it. So it means that it's either kind of superficial choroidal or just quite deep retinal. And um, actually with a little bit of help, you can just see this line over here that tells you the retina is uh, lifting at the same time. Um, over here, the superior of the retina looks okay. And the other eye was completely fine. So we did some fluorescent angiography. This is at an early phase where you see arterial filling. Um, and actually, if you pay attention, you can see over here that there is a bit of a gap here that's looking as if it might be developing. And this is kind of a late phase where the fluorescent has gone through everything. And you can see that <clears throat> that area is masked already. So it tells you that there is some sort of lesion uh, in the area that I mentioned. And you can also see that the effect of the fluid um, by uh, this kind of circle that's over here on fluorescent angiography. This is ICG. So this tells you about uh, choroidal. We don't have that in at ESH. To be honest, we probably don't see many patients like this, but it tells you that there's a lesion in the choroid and there is obviously some masking here. And that's as expected. Um, you can see lifting of the retina um, and it, OCT is actually quite a good way of seeing where the lesions are. And it tells you if it's in the retina uh, or choroid. I apologize, I think I mentioned in the choroid, I meant in the retina. So we did some blood tests, essentially pretty much everything came back normal. HLA B51 is something you do for Bechet's. ANA is kind of your um, screen for autoimmune conditions. And unless they have any other systemic symptoms to make me think it might, you might be dealing with an autoimmune condition, I wouldn't do anything else more than ANA. Um, VDRL, always do VDRL, so that's syphilis test. You always do ACE, you always check TB. So TB and sarcoid often can go together um, as differentials. So in her, that was negative, serum ACE was negative. Syphilis can cause pretty much everything, so you must do that. The rest of her bloods were okay. So, and by the way, just because the tests are negative, it doesn't mean that the patient doesn't have it. Um, so sometimes you can get false negatives, which means that the patient might still have the condition. But obviously, if it's positive, it helps quite a lot. Um, so, for example, in syphilis, the TPH, the VDRL test is positive in, I think, something like 60 or 70 percent. Secondary syphilis is like pretty much 99 percent VDRL is positive. So, um, you know, you've got to kind of take these things into account. Uh, Toxa was another thing that kind of looked likely. And in fact, we because everything else was negative and we thought it kind of looks like Toxo. She was started on the trio of pyrimethamine, sulfadiazine and prednisolone. Um, we don't really use these anymore. We kind of tend to go with clindamycin or azithromycin because often sulfadiazine is not very well tolerated. Um, <clears throat> and um, it had caused her kind of, she was getting quite upset, I think, for, as a result of the drug therapy. Um, and amazingly, uh, seven days later on this antitoxic treatment, it looked better, um, although the vision hadn't improved. And the OCT shows that the fluid had pretty much gone, although there was still a little bit of central elevation. But surprisingly, her toxic IgG and IgM were negative. So we were really expecting to see that these, are, these were going to turn up to be positive. And sometimes you can get that, you know, you can get uh, patients that make you think, well, was it toxo or was it not? But because she was clinically getting better, we carried on with the treatment. And in fact, she got to 6-6 in both eyes with no subretinal fluid. So with toxo, generally the antitoxo IgG, IgG is kind of, IgM is the thing that appears in the first week of infection and then it declines. So it tells you about recent infection, whereas IgG um, tends to stay with you uh, for life. So although it can kind of wean, um, you are you able to detect it. Now that obviously depends on the infection, but with toxo you can. So if you've got somebody with you think is toxo, IgM is negative, but IgG is positive, it makes you think that at some point they've had the infection, but it probably wasn't recent. Now in her, the both were negative, which is very surprising, but the fact that she responded to uh, toxo was quite, toxo treatment was quite um, encouraging, 
and um, that made us kind of make the diagnosis in her with that. We always used to think that toxo was something that you always had and then it just became reactivated later in life when in fact uh, there was a big study in Brazil uh, where these are kind of there's a lot of toxo there and the current thinking in fact is that you acquire it as an adult so if you ingest a lot of toxo you get the whole systemic symptom hepatosplenomegaly, megaly lymphadenopathy fever weight loss awful you don't want it but if you get the toxo in small amounts you don't get the systemic symptom but it seems to go to the eye um, and that's uh, how we think uh, you get toxo so Indications for treatment, you don't always have to treat it, but if toxo is near a temporal arcade, the blood vessels could be affected if it's near the optic nerve. If there is significant vitritis causing inflammation and vision loss, or if the patient in any way is immunocompromised, you should treat. And treatment is often with one of the antibiotics. We probably use azithromycin and clindamycin now as first line. Um, and uh, you've got to be very careful with clindamycin in particular because it can cause diarrhea and Toxic colon. So azithromycin is my favorite, to be honest. And then you start to them, you start them on prednisolone to get rid of the inflammation. And that's fine because you've got antibiotic cover. So in this particular condition, although it's an infective cause, you still need oral prednisolone to treat the inflammation. And then you taper the steroids down, keep the antibiotics on, and then after about 20 milligrams or 15 milligrams, you can stop the antibiotic and then taper the steroids down and hopefully it won't come back. Um, okay, next case, Asian man, 73 years old, cloudy vision in both eyes for five to six weeks, vision 6-12 in both eyes, for previous cataract surgery, he um, had bronchiectasis with renal failure and diabetes together with hypothyroidism and very significantly because of um, HBV, he had had um, liver transplant. So you can imagine that he would be on loads of immunosuppressants. So cell stepped over there um, as the main mode of uh, reduced kind of managing it um, and various other medication. So this tells you that there's inflammation. Hopefully you'll agree with me that it's a um, not a very clear picture which shows you there's either AC or uh, vitreous activity. And that was in the right eye and that's in the left eye. No obvious vasculitis seen. There might be like a bit of hemorrhage there. And then very importantly, when you start looking at the peripheral fundus, you can see this very granular white lesion in the back of the eye. This is why it's very important to dilate your patients with uveitis. You will not be forgiven for not dilating because if you miss this, then the, uh, effects can be devastating. So you must, must dilate every uveitis patient that you see uh, and who presents you to make sure that the back of the eye is okay. So you've got hemorrhages there together with uh, this kind of granular retinitis. And this is kind of picture of the other eye, which shows you again, hemorrhages and this retinitis. So you know something big is going on. From the history, you know he's massively immunosuppressed because he's had a liver transplant and he's on very high dose immunosuppression. So you're thinking this is an opportunistic infection. Um, infl inflammation, of course, you can think it might be an inflammatory condition, but generally, you know, your immune system has to be working hard for the inflammatory condition to present. So generally, if you're very immunosuppressed, I would be thinking more along the lines of infection than anything else. So what do you do next? Well, if you think somebody has uh, some sort of um, retinitis that might be infective, um, Think about the conditions I told you. So you think bacterial, viral, fungal, parasite. That didn't look like toxa to me. Toxa tends to be solitary lesion. Fungal lesions tend to present with kind of cannonballs in the vitreous or something like that. Um, viral retinitis looks very much like that. So you need that's kind of your top differential. Again, syphilis in the back of the eye, I know it can do anything, but again, it was atypical for that and TB tends to mainly present with a solitary granuloma or miliary TB where you've got massive choroiditis, uh, choroidal lesion, sorry, massive choroidal lesion. So we thought, well, this is probably some sort of retinitis and because his, he was so immunosuppressed, CMV retinitis uh, was what we uh, went with. Um, 
but obviously you do the tap, uh, AC tap, vitreous tap, and wait and see what the results are. I think nowadays, to be honest, we tend to more rely on AC tap because when you do a vitreous tap, you are likely to disturb the vitreous and the retina can detach. So if, so if you can do the PCR on AC tap and that's probably a lot safer. Anyway, he had intravitreal for scarnet, which is antiviral, and he had val gancyclovir at a much lower dose because of course he had renal impairment. And a lot of these acyclovir, gancyclovir type um, antivirals can affect your kidneys. So you have to consider, you don't want to kind of save the eye, but send them into massive renal failure. So two days later, not a lot of change, really. You still had quite a lot of uh, retinitis with hemorrhages, but you could see in this area, there is kind of, the area is kind of looking as if the retinitis is going away. You've got RP pigmentation. Blood tests have come back and to no surprise, the CD4 count was severely down. Um, and of course, when the CD4 count gets below um, 200, then you are kind of at risk of these opportunistic infections and CMV is, is one of them. Um, and the AC tap had come back for various viruses and the CMV as we thought was positive. Now, the reason you do the AC tap is because different viruses respond differently to different antivirals. So gancyclovir, acyclovir, they work better for different um, herpes uh, viruses. And um, we were lucky with that. With this patient, obviously, we got it right. So he was stable, and uh, the CD4 count was obviously still low, um, but he started to develop pancytopenia, which means that um, there was further suppression of the bone marrow and worsening renal function um, <clears throat> because of his treatment. They stopped the mycophenolate and started him on prednisolone. And then we had to dumb down the valgan cyclovir even more because you have to think that, well, the patient is failing, basically. He's going to die unless you manage the pancytopenia. Um, so with all that management, the pancytopenia improved and the CMV became negative. So that's a much better picture. Six weeks later, you can see the back of the eye without any inflammatory signs, which is quite good. And that was the area that had the retinitis. So that's what you want to see. Just complete resolution of the retinitis, no hemorrhages. And um, it's almost like putting a fire out. That's all looking good. So that was management of CMV retinitis um, in patients. One thing that I would probably say to you is that you don't expect to see, to see too much in a way of inflammation in patients who are very immunosuppressed because as I mentioned to you, you need to mount an immune response. So it was a bit unusual as I sort of see that to see a bit of vitritis in this patient. Often patients with CMV retinitis tend not to have um, vitritis, but acute retinal necrosis, which is a different, which is caused by kind of the herpes zoster or simplex, tend to happen in immunocompetent patients. And there you get a lot of inflammation because your body is able to mount an immune response. CMV retinitis, you tend not to because the immune system is really low. So you're not gonna get much of an in way of vitritis. 11 year old boy referred by an optician. That's case number six. So I'm just going quick, just trying to get all, our pa all, all the patients in. Notice increased blurring of vision in the left eye, no pain, no floaters. Uh, vision was good in the right eye, in the left eye vision was 636. And there was a bit of vitritis, nothing really to go on about. That was the right eye. And in the left eye, you can just see that this is just an abnormal looking eye. You can see some lesion here. So that looks quite deep. It looks choroidal. Um, you see the blood vessel over it. There's hemorrhage around the lesion and that looks elevated. So in the right eye, there are some also scattered white peripheral lesions. I uh, don't think we have a picture of that, unfortunately. Um, but in the left eye, um, although centrally looked okay, there were again some white lesions in the periphery. Um, and of course, this lesion in the macula. And that you can see, again, OCT is great because you, you can see that there is some sort of infiltrate within the retina. And hopefully most of you would have guessed that this is an inflammatory membrane that's showing through. So we did an angiogram. It's a very beautiful angiogram of a picture 
showing a classic membrane. Classic membrane, you see, you can see the blood vessels showing at a very early stage and is very clearly defined here. Um, so this is choroidal vessels coming through because of an RP defect. Um, actually, you might be able to, so actually these lesions, peripheral lesions are showing nicely here. You can see three lesions here, but he had more lesions in the periphery. And uh, you can also see some peripapillary changes. So uh, again, on the color photo, it probably doesn't show very well, but on the angiogram, you can see some peripapillary changes by the disc, okay? So you're going through your surgical sieve, but a boy is unlikely to be, uh, you know, it could of course be an inflammatory condition. Again, when a condition is unilateral, uh, you're thinking more along the line of inflammation, uh, sorry, infection, when it's bilateral, it's more inflammation, but in this case, it was in both eyes. So we asked about pets, he just had a bearded lizard, I'm not aware of how that could be relevant in this case. Systemically, he was well, no skin symptom, no skin lesion, sorry. We referred him to peds, there was nothing, chest secret was normal, inflammatory markers were fine. So Toxo again was top or multi focal choroiditis, that's often a diagnosis of exclusion. But because he had some lesions around the disc and he had an inflammatory membrane, we thought whether that could be uh, presumed ocular histoplasmosis. So that is kind of what you tend to see with patients with POHS. Um, you tend to see changes around the disc. So that's quite important to see these peripapillary changes. And then they tend to develop these cordonovascular membranes and these punched out lesions that I mentioned in the periphery. Why do we call it presumed? Well, so the clinical diagnosis, as I said, it's just a combination of several ocular findings. Um, that includes peripapillary atrophy or pigmentation, as I said, these punched out atrophic choroidal retinal lesions, and then um, over, you know, a bit of vitritis overlying the lesions. It was originally described back in 1960, um, and there was this association with uh, the fungi histoplasma capsulosa. And that was found to be, the, the kind of the fungus anyway, found to be quite prevalent in Ohio and Mississippi uh, River, uh, where the patients were diagnosed with, well, with his, you know, ocular his, histoplasmosis. But in a majority of patients who present with this kind of lesions, you don't tend to find the actual fungi on the skin test. So that's why they call it presumed because they, because they think, well, the clinical picture would look as if they have had the fungal infection, but you can't actually isolate that they've ever been exposed to it. Um, so syndrome usually causes no symptoms in early stages. Uh, initial infection subsides with tiny scars like histo, uh, spots and, and that remains at the infectious sites. But the worry, of course, is that the spread has come from lesions in the lung. So anything essentially uh, with respect to retin. So why do you have an inflammatory membrane? Well, anything that affects the Brooks membrane can cause choroidal neovascular new, new membrane. So in this case, the histo spots were the cause for development of CMVM. This goes back to some time ago. You don't laser these now, we use anti vegf therapy. And in fact, it's very, it's quite common now, any patient generally with all these other conditions, PIC, POHS, multiple choroiditis, VKH, all these conditions that can affect your choroid and retina, can affect the Brooks membrane, can develop a secondary choroid and vascular membrane. And you can treat the CNBM with um, anti vegf therapy. And Avastin is what we normally use. Um, you are, of course have to treat them with immunosuppressants in form of oral prednisolone to calm the condition down, but the actual membrane won't really respond to steroid therapy. You need to use um, anti vegf therapy, which we have access to, so that's great. So he had um, initial Avastin on the GA, obviously, because there was only 11. At that time, we had to get PCT uh, approval. And then he had further antivage of therapy and his vision improved to 6.9 from 6.36. And then one month later, he had more flare-up and more antivage of therapy. So he actually did quite well uh, after all that with the, with the CMBM. And, that, and actually, that's one of the things with inflammatory membranes. So, so it's not like wet AMD, <clears throat> where the RPJ, ROPE, the photoreceptors are quite knackered. 
because of the age-related process in younger patients where you've got what we call a membrane that's sitting on top of the RP, they respond normally quite quickly and quite well to antiphage of therapy and often with quite good vision. And usually you find that like myopic CMV, a lot of patients with inflammatory CMV, they tend to need a lot less injections than some patients that you've all seen in AMD clinics. Case seven, a uh, 77 year old lady referred by GP, presented two to three weeks history, gradually loss of vision, slight aching, aching the eyes, bilateral cataract surgery, severe asthmatic with COPD, recently discharged from the hospital, and she had shingles uh, on the right of the abdomen. I made it easy for you. Patient is on oral prednisolone, so they're immunosuppressed, lives with husband, nothing else. Vision's down in both eyes. So again, going through your kind of thinking, vision's down, you need to do something. You don't have time to sit down and wait for investigations to come back. You need to try and see what the pattern is and start patient on some treatment. So here shows you can't hardly see anything because there is so much vitritis that you can't see anything. Those of you who have kind of been into clinics and sat with me, hopefully will appreciate that there is quite significant vasculitis here affecting the arterial side. Again, the veins look okay, but the arteries seem to be affected. So there's an arteritis, whatever you want to call it. And then this is a peripheral uh, picture showing quite um, a confluent area of retinitis, uh, which was in the right eye and actually the left eye as well. So, the, so in the history, I've given you the um, clue that the patient had zoster. So hopefully you should be thinking about acute retinal necrosis or first, well, firstly an infective cause uh, for this problem. So remember the pattern, arthritis versus kind of phlebitis, which is the one affecting veins, amount of vitritis, and the fact that she was immunodeficient. This is quite a nice table really telling you about various conditions where they affect and what they do. So acute retinal necrosis, you tend to get arthritis. That's secondary to zoster and simplex infection. Systemic vasculitides such as SLE, PAN, Wegener's um, tend to affect the arterial side. TB, sarcoid, uh, Bechet's, um, Eels disease, which we think is kind of related to TB, HIV tend to affect the veins. And sometimes it can affect both. So in this patient, obviously you, this is kind of a differential, um, but again, it doesn't look like toxo, doesn't look like TB because of what I've mentioned before. Um, TB, as I said, gives you a solitary granuloma or you get choroiditis, didn't look like fungi. So toxo again, tends to be solitary lesion, this confluent retinitis with um, anterior uveitis and vitritis really is very typical of acute retinal necrosis. Um, you can never argue with syphilis, I suppose. That can pretty much cause anything. Bechet's again, uh, to get retinitis like that, I suppose is unusual. Um, one thing that again, you should remember is inflammatory causes of uveitis. So non-infective inflammatory cause um, tend to cause macular edema, whereas infective cause of uveitis tend not to cause macular edema. Um, so generally with acute retinal necrosis, what you need is a combination of vasculitis, granulomatous uveitis, and retinitis. So this patient uh, kind of had all this condition. And um, this is another kind of picture of ARN where you can see confluent peripheral retinitis coming down. You're really against time with acute retinal necrosis, necrosis. So what you need to do is to tap the anterior chamber, as I said, to send off PCR for viruses that can take weeks to come back. Uh, we do intravitreal uh, for scarnet at the same time and start the patient on high dose of oral valacyclovir. Um, so Unlike CMV retinitis in, sorry, acute retinal necrosis tends to happen in immunocompetent patients. So there's nothing wrong with the immune system, which is why they mount such an uh, aggressive immune response. Um, 
if if not treated well or if you're not careful unfortunately that once the retinitis settles down it can become quite paper thin develop holes and then detach once you get retinal detachment on it's very difficult to fix you can barrier laser them uh, although with a lot of vitritis it's diff quite difficult to barrier laser them so the jury is out on that one uh, whether barrier laser is helpful or not but of course you know it's not great you need to be on top of these eyes uh, quite quickly um, sorry, other causes. So if they have got significant immunocompromise, then you can get this thing, which is aptly called PORN, progressive atherotomy necrosis. And that you, uh, it tends to kind of look different to ARN because you tend to get central lesions with these, but essentially it's caused by herpetic um, viruses and, it ha and that happens when they're very immunocompromised. We've already discussed uh, CMV retinitis in patients with CD4 count of less than 50. This is a very beautiful picture of a patient with CMV retinitis, um, probably more typical, as you can see, very nice picture of the eye because you don't have vitritis because they can't mount an immune response. And you can see this kind of, this almost like looks like a fire um, with, flame, with flame hemorrhages and this retinitis just destroying the eye as it goes through. Um, and again, you need to be on top of these quite quickly. Um, so we've kind of discussed that uh, and other stuff. So treatment options, we don't, to be honest, we don't tend to do intravenous um, in patients with, who are immunocompetent. Obviously, if they're immunocompromised, that's completely different. You need to get the medics in and often they have concurrent HIV or uh, uh, AIDS or something like that, that you need to involve the SCD consultants, but um, immunocompetent patients, oral valley site, Lovia should suffice. And there was a paper out from Tommy's that showed that if you do intravitreal Foscana, sorry, um, that tends to help as well. But they can get retinal detachment. I said secondary glaucoma, optic neuropathy. So that's when you've lost the eye, unfortunately. And these are kind of advanced stages. So he did quite, um, so anyway, so we did the bloods, started them on various medication, vision got worse in the left, but in the right was 624. Um, bloods came back, his white count was fine. We sent all the other stuff, which came back as nothing. And uh, we managed to get VZV, um, which is herpes zoster. EBV was positive, but often uh, this may or may not be significant. Um, there's often some sort of, you know, often when you have positive VZV or HSV, sometimes EBV can be positive as well. I'm not sure the significance of that here. Um, so gradual reduction in vitritis, retina appeared stable and flat, and uh, they started to drop down the steroid dose because we want to reduce the anti-inflammatory effect. Um, you can see after three days, perhaps slightly better in both eyes. <clears throat> it's important in this condition to realize the rapid uh, progression of this condition. Unfortunately, this patient didn't do very well. Um, and the vision, I can't remember offhand what it came up to, but the vision went down in both eyes. Uh, the, the main thing being really that by the time she was seen and treated, it was already quite late with the amount of arthritis and damage to the retina. So if you see a patient with granulomatous uveitis, and what do I mean by that? I mean this. So this is granulomatous uveitis. You get these mutton fat KPs. So if you've got, if you've got disappearance in uveitis, there's something going on. This is not your typical anterior uveitis. So you've got these kind of what we call mutton fat endothelial lesions. And that's what you get with, you can get that with acute necrosis. If you get that, make sure you've dilated, look at the back of the eye. If you see any white stuff at the back, call the on-call doctor and refer straight away. So I wanna talk a little bit quickly about mutton fat uh, KPs. So just generally, um, I'm not gonna go through these cases, I'm, there's, there's not enough time, but you know, they just look very, very obvious. Um, this is another example of mutton fat KP. So you get these kind of endothelial deposits of white cells. Um, and I think actually it's probably better to uh, go through to my last case. Um, 
Um, this condition, so this is something that's not modern fat KB. So you've got endothelial lesions here, and you tend to see this in uh, patients with Fuchs heterochromic erythrocyclitis. So they don't look like modern fat, they just kind of look like individual lesions. And as you can see, actually, with this kind of conditions, there's always the, the KPs are always worse inferiorly because the inflammatory cells tend to kind of settle down. Whereas in Fuchs, uh, the cells, sorry, tend to be quite uniformly spread across the cornea. Okay, so uh, just some more examples of character precipitates here. Uh, you've all seen anterior chamber cells. For those of you who work in the hospital, the best time to see an anterior chamber cell is uh, watching somebody who's just had cataract surgery. If you sit them on a slit lamp, you will, you'll be able to see kind of cells sloshing around um, or just see them quite quickly post-op. By the time you see them after the surgery, often uh, it's all gone. So more examples, we call these copay nodules, you tend to see these in uh, sarcoids. So always quite important to look at the iris. That's what we call a pupillary membrane with hypopion and fibrinous membrane here, just lots of fibrin. Um, so generally, of course, the goal of therapy in generally with kind of patients with anterior uveitis um, is to preserve pain, to relieve pain and photophobia, eliminate inflammation, uh, make sure you know what the secondary cause is and reserve good function, okay? Finally, last case. So this was a curious case of unilateral disc swelling. 30-year-old um, male presented with acute history of, this was actually at ESHT, so I saw this patient with Stella and, um, I'll come to me, it was somebody else as well. Anyway, 30-year-old 30, 30 male, acute history of blurred vision in the left eye with Kenling, sorry, Kenling. 24 hour prior to attending to the eye clinic, woke up in the morning with some blurring of vision on the left. Few days preceding, there was some discomfort, no headaches, nothing else, no fevers or chills. Systemic history is completely normal. Not notice any glands or lumps anywhere. He's diabetic and he had a urostomy as a child. So again, nothing that's significant. He's on metformin, not working at the moment, rarely drinks, wasn't sexually active, um, denied any recreational drugs, had a cat at home. So vision, you can see is everything's pretty good on the right. On the left, 612 vision. The disc looks swollen, although the Ishihara score was quite good. So hopefully you will see here a normal looking disc. On the left, you can see that there is swelling of the nerve. That's kind of a more magnified picture here with some telangiectetic vessels on the disc and dilated vessels on the disc. His afebrile BM was a bit high, nothing else really. That was the OCT. So it's always quite important to do a disc and the macular OCT event, this kind of tells you that you've got uh, elevation of the neurosensory retina. That is detachment of the fovea. So it just means that the, there is, you know, the fovea is kind of detached from the uh, uh, RP. And yeah, so it's not a PED, it's foveal detachment. Uh, this looked normal on the right, but on the left, that's all white because there's so much swelling and uh, you know the, the thickness that that would tell you what's happening there. ESR was raised, so 38, CRP quite high, 50. Um, everything else was okay. So we did the TB, syphilis, toxo. Um, everything else was okay. We looked for Lyme disease, although he didn't really have any history, but you know we thought we'd look for it. Um, Lyme disease is another one that can cause uveitis and this swelling, etc. Um, now he had a CT scan of the head. Again, that was normal. Um, let me just before I come back to this. So this is first in angiography again. That just shows some leakage at the disc. CT was good. Um, visual fields didn't show anything obvious in the right eye. In the left eye, interestingly, there appeared to be some sort of what I thought was perhaps a superior visual field defect. But when I talk to some of my other colleagues, they felt that that wasn't really, there wasn't really a superior visual field defect because of course that would have gone 
with an inferior disc swelling. So really differential diagnosis here, you think, well, <clears throat> could this be diabetic papillitis, uh, especially as BMs were not controlled? With papillitis, you tend to have a swollen optic nerve, but the vision tends to be fairly well preserved. Um, and also you might see something different on the visual field. Could it be a non-arteritic visual field? So non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. Um, again, you didn't know what the disc looked like before, but certainly this disc doesn't look as if there's, there's a very small cup, but that was a possibility. And um, it was something we thought about, but given the fact that there wasn't a convincing uh, visual field defect superiorly, um, that kind of made us think, well, maybe not that. Um, but then as time progressed, he started to then develop a hemorrhage, the swelling got worse and he got the macular star. So now we are looking at neuroretinitis. So uh, given the fact that he had cat at home, and then I think he mentioned that his kitten had kind of scratched him, we thought he might have um, cat scratch disease. The way to find that is you need to do Bartonella serology, but apparently it's not available in the UK. We tried several labs and apparently you couldn't get it, which was really strange. Um, so he, we also referred him to the infectious disease people and see whether they could do a lumbar puncture, but they tried a couple of times and he couldn't. So then he needed a GA, but in fact, when we sought him on azithromycin uh, for the treatment, the condition improved. So if I just, sorry, try, trying to not make you sick. So that's kind of 18-2, 25-2, this star was going away and vision has started to come up. And you can see here very nicely that his ESR started to go down, CRP started to go down, and the macular edema and foveal detachment has started to resolve. So, so it's a very nice case history of patient with cast crash disease. So who says you don't see unusual things in Eastbourne? So look, at the end of the day, you're all likely to come across uveitis at some point. Common things are common. Always think first anatomically. Is this at the front? Is this at the back? Is this affecting the whole eye? Look, look for choroidal lesions, retinal lesions, vasculitic lesions. Look for macular edema. Look for swollen disc. Um, especially if the back of the eye is affected, then the chance that this could be systemic or something not great goes up significantly. Um, if you've got a patient with anterior uveitis, you must dilate them to look at the back of the eye. The second thing is history is very important in patients with uveitis. So you want to look for the pattern. So remember I said the main top three were infection, inflammation, and masquerade. So with infection, you go through your sieve, surgical sieve, so your TB, your sarcoid. So, so questions have to be directed. You know, your travel history will get rid of TB. Any family people come from, you know, Asian countries where it might be prevalent will, will help you with that. Sexual history will help you with um, uh, syphilis and HIV or any sign of immunocompromised using IV drugs, again, immunocompromised. Asking about systemic condition. Have you got any systemic conditions you've been diagnosed with? If the answer is yes, that could be very important. If it's no, ask about common rheumatological conditions. So joint problems, skin rashes, breathing problems, you know, because the eye might be the first presentation. Obviously, if they've got something diagnosed like Bechet's and then they come with the uveitis, it's a relatively easy diagnosis to make. But if the eye is the first one, you need to start, and the patient will not tell you that they've had these other things. So you need to make that link. Uh, I suppose the next thing is you need to think whether you have time to uh, treat this patient or not. So what goes through my head is, can I send off the bloods? Do I have time for this to come back before I treat them? If the answer is yes, then you keep a very close watch on them. And as long as the vision is not going down, the disc is not swollen, you haven't got massive macroedema, and you know the eye is not at risk of loss of sight, then you probably have time. If not, then you will have to treat. And often it might be a guess. So you might have to uh, treat the patient with high dose of steroid, which is something you need, unless you think it's very infective. Um, or 
what I've done occasionally is start them on an azithromycin and an antiviral, as well as the steroid until the results come back. So it is very important. And of course, counseling is very important because if they have got something that will require lifelong immunosuppression, they will stay with you for life. And that's something that often, unfortunately, is not understood. So every time I get a patient with uveitis, they will stay with me for life. And often the first few weeks or months, I'm seeing them every week or every other week. Um, so it is quite a burden for them and for us uh, to manage patients. But they are interesting, very interesting patients. And it is very important to make diagnosis quickly in order to avoid uh, them losing sight. So I think on that note, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, Ian, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you, can you hear me? Yep. I'm just gonna try and uh, get my screen back. I seem to be having computer problems. Well, ask Sarah to help you. She stood here and she didn't help me. I can't share my screen. Hang on. Hang on, let's have a look. That was a really good talk. You should be able to. Oh no, you still can't see me, can you? Can well, you see me? I I can see somebody. Is that you? Ten years ago, Ian, because you don't look like that now. <laughs> that was before marriage. Yeah, I was gonna say. I don't think. Yeah, he had he had hair then as well. I I can talk. I know. I've lost it since working with you. <laughs> can you see the questions from the participants? There or? are no questions. So, um, is there, if anyone's got any questions. If you'd like to type away now, oh, there you are. Oh, no, I'm back. Yeah, I think uh, you're bored today. But no, no, that was a really interesting. It's quite interesting to see real cases of what actually happens, and um, I now know what to do when I see a patient who comes in to see me in in community. I'll know how to treat them, and uh, I won't need to send them on to you. So uh, yeah. you're redundant now. <laughs> but I still think we've got no questions. So that's good. Okay, I can't so, have it early. I'll um, say, well, thank you very much, Shah. It's been really fascinating. That's all right. I will... Um, will be a part three to uveitis, but if there is any any interest on... I mean, we can always talk about drugs and things, probably not not going to be that exciting. But I think, I think um, the main thing in community, really, is that make sure you've dilated your patients and you've looked at the back of the eye. If you do have any questions, you're more than welcome to text me. I can see... Katie is Katie Toppin has been very active on WhatsApp while I've been doing the lecture and Maria Brady. I'm so glad that those are at least, you know, connected during this time. But uh, I think Katie's been watching a different lecture. Huh? What? Katie Katie's been watching uh, a different yeah. lecture. Yeah, I think so. We're talking about babies and stuff. So anyway, it's good. So <laughs> I will aim to get the CET uploaded. Hold on, there's a question. There's a question. There's a question. Why is Ian so bald? No, is atropine used very often to break posterior sinicae? So actually, that's a very good question. Um, we actually uh, don't use atropine uh, for a very good reason, in that with uveitis, you want to stop patients developing posterior sinicae. And in fact, what you do with atropine is because is it dilates the pupil and fixes the pupil for quite a long time, then the risk of your posterior sinicae and getting um, zipping of your angle goes up. So we use a shorter acting midrelate, uh, like cyclopentylate or something like that to help. Some people even advocate using tropicamide two or three times a day to give that. So to keep the pupil dilated, but at the same time, give it some contraction ability. Brilliant, thank you very much. Any other questions before we, um, we sign off? We have a question again. I, um, no, I, I was going to say, I will, I'm going to load the CT this weekend and the, the video will be on, I'll, I'll make the video available on YouTube, which is for those who, who don't know, is the East Sussex Eye Group. So if you look on YouTube for our, our channel and you can see the previous webinars on there as well. Um, but I'll get that up this week, hopefully this weekend on Saturday. Um, but I think because it's 10 past nine, um, yeah. I think I'll say thank you very much, Shah. Thank you very much for everyone for watching. And keep looking on the uh, the uh, the group and I'll let you know when the next webinar uh, will be. Thank you for organising it, Ian. Cheers. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye.